What I saw was the Count's head coming out from the window. I did not see the face, but I knew the man by the movement of his back and arms. I could not mistake the hands. I was at first interested and amused, but my feelings changed to repulsion and terror when I saw the whole man slowly emerge from the window and crawl down the castle wall over the dreadful abyss, face down, with his cloak spreading out around him like great wings. I did not believe my eyes. I thought it was some trick of the moonlight, some weird effect of shadow, but I kept looking, and it could be no delusion. I saw the fingers and toes grasp the corners of the stones and thus move downwards with considerable speed, just as a lizard moves along a wall. What manner of man is this, or what manner of creature? Is it in the semblance of man? I am in awful fear, and there is no escape. This is the end. Beautiful friend This is the end Greetings kittens Welcome to the podcast of Doom The podcast devoted to epic failure analysis I'm your host David Appleson That excerpt I just read came from Bram Stoker's famous gothic novel Dracula Today we're going to examine the historical figure that Stoker used as his model for the creepy and eccentric title character of his world-famous book. The real Dracula was the Romanian equivalent of a prince, not a count. The domain he ruled was Valachia, not neighboring Transylvania, and his preferred method for killing people was by impalement, not by a bite to the neck. The real Dracula was credited with killing tens of thousands of people, while the fictional Dracula could only dream of such numbers. So, let's take a look at the real person who inspired one of horror fiction's most enduring figures. Merriam-Webster defines a legend as a story coming down from the past, especially popularly regarded as historical, although not verifiable. Legends can be famous or infamous. King Arthur was a legend, as was Daniel Boone, Ned Kelly, Finn McCool, Queen Boudicca, and Ivan the Terrible. When stories of legends are passed on through succeeding generations, their acts and accomplishments grow grander with each telling. Eventually, their popular images do not allow them to remain as mere mortal people. They become demigods. Merriam-Webster also defines a legacy as something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or predecessor or from the past. Wars can leave a legacy of pain and suffering, Andrew Carnegie left a legacy of philanthropy and giving. Mother Teresa left a legacy of caring and concern for others. Genghis Khan left a legacy of terror and destruction, but one of organization and leadership as well. While Mahatma Gandhi left a legacy of nonviolent resistance. Today we will examine the legend and the legacy of history's greatest role model for the perfect vampire. Vlad Tepish was born into very interesting times. There is no certainty regarding his date of birth, but most researchers on the subject peg it somewhere between November and December 1431 in the Transylvanian city of Zhigishwara. At that time, Transylvania was part of the much larger empire of Hungary. His father was Vlad Dracul II, who was governor of Transylvania at the time of Vlad III's birth. He received the name Dracul from the military noble Order of the Dragons. The order was established by King Zygismund of Hungary in 1408, sworn to defend the Christian cross against the infidel Muslim Ottomans. The name Dracula, which Vlad would use officially in his later years, simply meant the son of the dragon, or son of his father Dracul. However, it has a second meaning in modern Romanian, the devil and a tribute that many of Vlad's detractors would assign to him. As for Tepish, that wasn't even his family name. It's a sobriquet given to him by others, either admirers or enemies. It means the one who impales other people. As mentioned, Vlad lived in interesting times. His father, Vlad Dracul, held a claim to the throne of Valachia, a principality in what is now the southern portion of modern Romania. Valachia was ruled by a vavoid, or what we would consider a prince, which meant more authority than a governor, but less territory than a king. 
This claim was traced back several generations, but since Valekians don't practice succession by primogeniture or passage of rule to the firstborn son, this caused a number of problems when the old Vovoid died. Over a period of 58 years, the ruler of Valekia changed 29 times, with some claimants sitting on the throne several different times. Such an arrangement does not lead to stability. Add to that that Valekia was situated in between two large competing empires. The Kingdom of Hungary and the Ottoman Empire were both ruled by men desiring to absorb Valekia into the spheres of expanding influence. Taken all together, you don't exactly have the makings of a House of Windsor. So how did Valekia end up that way, so desirable, yet so unstable? As it pertains to our central character, Valekia itself was more of a recent creation, coming along in the 14th century. The area of Romania, where Valekia lies, contains the Cave of Bones, an archaeological site that holds human bones that are 40,000 years old, some of the oldest found in Europe. The first written accounts we have come from Herodotus, who mentions people known as the Gadi and the Dacians, living in the Carpathian Mountains and in the valleys along the Danube River. In the first century BC, a kingdom close in shape to modern-day Romania arose under the leadership of Boribista. In the first century AD, they fended off a Roman attack. That defeat did not sit well with Emperor Trajan, and in two attacks, one in 101 and one in 105, the Romans conquered Dacia, giving the territory Roman administration as well as a Roman name and Latin language. The Romans remained for 165 years before withdrawing under barbarian pressure in 271, leaving the Dacians to defend for themselves. For the next 1,000 years, that is generally what they did. First, the Goths came to visit. No, not the dour ones who wear black and stay indoors all day. The original Goths from the Russian steppes. Next came the Huns out of West Asia, followed by the Gepids and then the Slavs. In the 6th century, the Avars invaded only to find themselves bumped up against the uninvited Bulgars. In the 900s, it was the Zakili's turn to invade and take control, and later the Peshugnegs, and the Cumans arrived for a stay. By now, you kind of get the feeling that Romania was Europe's welcome mat for barbarian invaders out of Asia, and geographically speaking, it was. It must have come as a relief when the German Saxons arrived as mostly traders and merchants in the 12th century. However, the people of the Carpathians and the Danube weren't allowed too much rest as the much-feared Mongols arrived in their masses in the early 13th century. The Mongols crossed the Carpathians in 1241 and absolutely devastated the entire area for a whole year, and unlike the previous invaders, they made no attempt to settle. One year later, they left a destroyed land with villages flattened, residents slaughtered, and any semblance of order ruined. It would take years for the area to recover. But in 1290, according to local legend, Radu Negru, or Rudolf the Black, founded the Principality of Valachia by fusing together smaller states. It was one of three principalities that made up the area of Romania in the late Middle Ages, with the other two being Moldavia to the northeast and Transylvania to the northwest. Valachia fell under Hungarian influence for the next few decades until the rise of Prince Basarab the Great in 1330. Under Basarab's leadership, Valachia regained its independence. He was also the ancestor of Vlad Dracula, having founded the line that would rule Valachia for centuries. Basarab had a Turkish name, but his faith was either Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. Basarab was succeeded by his son, Nikolai Alexander, in 1352. Alexander worked hard to keep good relations with both the Roman Catholic Hungarians and the Eastern Orthodox Byzantines. He was succeeded by his son, Vladislav I, in 1354, who swore fealty to Louis I of Hungary in return from some nearby territory. Vladislav was followed by Radu I, his half-brother, in 1377. Radu was best known for building a number of Catholic churches in Valachia, although his relations with the King of Hungary remained strained at best. 
Radu was succeeded by his son, Dan I, whose short reign ran from 1384 to 1387. Short because Dan was assassinated, either by the local nobles or by Ottoman agents, as the Turks were starting to make their presence known. It was Dan's death that split the Basarab line. This is where things get messy. Dan was succeeded by Mircea I, also known as Mircea the Elder. Mircea actually turned out to be one of the most important voids of Vilekia. Under Mircea, Vilekia expanded to its largest size. He strengthened the state, organized the high offices, grew the economy, increased royal revenues, granted trade privileges to merchants from Poland and Lithuania, increased the size of the military, rebuilt fortifications, and threw its support behind the Eastern Orthodox Church. Mircea took on the expanding realm of the Turkish Ottoman Empire and allied himself with the rulers of Poland and Hungary so that they would have his back when he took on the Ottomans. He used asymmetrical or guerrilla warfare when the Ottomans invaded with a force of 40,000 soldiers that Mircea stood no chance against in the open field. At the Battle of Ravenna, he defeated the Ottomans by choosing swampy terrain as the battleground, thus hindering the mobility of the Turkish cavalry. When Tamerlane struck at the Turks from the Asian side of their empire, Mircea took advantage of the situation by conquering evacuated Ottoman territory. When Mircea died in 1418, a battle for succession took place between Mircea's son and his brother Dan II. This split eventually evolved into a war of two factions that would last for several decades. On the one hand, you had the Dynasty faction, or the House of Dan, which included Dan II and his descendants. On the other hand was the Draculesti faction, or House of Dracula, made up of the descendants of Mircea through his firstborn son. What followed was the 58 years of 29 reigns and only 12 different rulers. They just kept battling back and forth over who actually controlled the throne. Kind of like a certain story regarding fire and ice as well as dragons. Just like our story. In a way. Before he passed away, Mircea thought he would establish some stability to the order of succession by naming his son Mihaihil as co-ruler. But after Mircea died, Mihaihil's right to rule was challenged by Dan II. To make matters worse, Mihaihil ran into trouble almost immediately on becoming Vavoid. He chose to halt payment of the annual tribute to the Turks right as the Ottoman Empire was recovering from its defeat at the hands of Tamerlane. And in 1419, he joined the Hungarians in battle against the Ottomans along the Danube River, with the Vilekians and Hungarians losing badly. Mihail Hai was forced to pay the tribute again with interest, cede some of his Wolekia territory, and surrender his sons Mihail II and Radu as hostages to the Turks as a guarantee of good behavior. The boyars or nobles of Wolekia rebelled and threw their support behind the rival claimant, Dan II. In response, Mihail refused again to send the tribute to the Turks, and Dan II responded to that move by seeking the Sultan's support to overthrow his brother. The Sultan accepted this proposal, and Dan went to war against Mihail. Mihail, in turn, did what so many other small domain princes did and turned to a larger kingdom. In this case, the always handy Hungarians. The two sides met in battle. Mihail was killed and Dan assumed the throne. This conflict pretty much established the pattern right through Vlad Dracula's reign. The ruler of tiny Vilekia would side with either the much larger Ottoman Empire or the much larger Hungarian kingdom, and his opponent would enlist the aid of the rival kingdom. And presumably, at no time, did the Vilekian prince see himself as just a pawn in a much larger game. The next few years were basically just a back-and-forth struggle between the House of Dynasty and the House of the Draculesti. While Dan II assumed the throne, Radu II Prasnaglava, Dan's cousin and head of the House of Dragons, sought military assistance from Sigismund of Luxembourg, who was now the King of Hungary. Try to stay with me. In this medieval game of mutually assured destruction, Dan cozied up to the infidel Ottoman Turks. In return, Radu brought a new player into the game, Prince Alexander the Good, ruler of Vilekia's neighbor, Moldavia. 
Alexander had made Moldavia a rising power at that time, due in part to the instability in Wallachia. In 1427, after Radu had seized the throne with help from Alexander, Dan turned around and toppled Radu with help from Hungary. And to prevent a further coup, Dan had Radu and his two sons killed. Dan's only problem was that there were still a lot of other dragons kicking around. Prince Alexander handpicked Alexander Alda as his choice for the successor to Dan as Prince of Valachia, possibly because he liked his name. Dan once again deftly switched sides and allied himself with the Sultan. Sigismund, in turn, threw his support behind Alexander Alda. It was also at this time that Alexander Alda's half-brother, Vlad Dracul, our Vlad's dad, began his campaign to take his turn on the Valachian throne. His efforts paid off, and Sigismund appointed Vlad Dracul as governor of Transylvania, a great stepping-off point for an attack on Valachia, and the current holder of that throne. It was also during this time, when Vlad went to visit Sigismund in Nuremberg, that the king of Hungary bestowed upon Vlad the Order of the Dragon, in the hope that he would be inspired to kill more Muslim infidels. That title would pass down to his son, Dracula, the son of the dragon. Unfortunately for Vlad Dracul, Sigismund had a change of heart after bestowing Vlad with his title, and he threw his support behind Alexander Alda. In 1431, the two Alexanders launched an attack on Valachia. The attack worked, and Dan II fled to the Ottomans. The Sultan lent him some troops and told him to go back and take his rightful place on the throne. So armed, Dan went forth and lost again in battle, this time getting himself killed in the fight. Now ensconced on the very wobbly throne of Valachia, Alexander Alda found himself very alone when his most important friend, Alexander the Good, passed away in 1432. Furthermore, his enemy, the Ottomans, were on a roll, having defeated the Venetians at Salonika and Albania. Alexander surmised the situation, and more or less crawled to the Ottoman capital of Adrianople to ask terms of Sultan Morad II. Hostages, soldiers for our army, and an annual tribute was the Sultan's response. A deal was made, and Alexander returned to Valachia, feeling the Sultan had his back. Shortly after, Alexander paid a visit to Sigismund, also asking for peace terms. Not too happy with Alexander's deal with the Ottomans, Sigismund told Alexander where he could put his peace proposal. In 1436, Vlad Dracul attacked Alexander in Valachia but was repulsed with the help of Ottoman forces. However, fortune was on Vlad's side as Alexander died shortly after of natural causes. No, really, natural causes. With no other dragons or dance to stop him, Vlad Dracul ascended to the throne as Vovoid of Valachia. Immediately, Vlad Dracul found himself in the same bind as all of his predecessors, stuck between the rock of the Ottomans and the hard place of the Hungarian kingdom. He chose first to renounce the treaty that Alda had signed with the Ottoman sultan. That turned out to be a bad move as Sigismund died the following year. Crown in hand, Vlad Dracul went back to the sultan. Fortunately for him, the sultan was feeling charitable that day and merely asked for the same terms he had agreed to with Alexander Alda. Oh, and also, I'm planning to launch an attack against Transylvania. Why don't you join me? He did, and the two rulers plundered Transylvania dry. After that raid, Vlad Dracul paid a visit to Albrecht of Habsburg, the new king of Hungary. Yeah, I know. These kingdoms just seem to be squares on a chessboard open for occupancy. Albrecht, though, was none too happy to see Vlad after his little raid on Transylvania, and Vlad left empty-handed, although he did manage to anger Sultan Murad for seeking terms with his enemy. In 1440, Albrecht died, and King Landislaus of Poland collected the crown of Hungary, expanding his realm immensely. This new, supersized empire decided the time was right to attack the Ottomans. Vlad, sensing a change in the direction of the winds, allied himself with John Hunyadi, the new governor of Transylvania. With help from the Hungarians, Hunyadi defeated the Ottomans that had been stationed in Transylvania. 
Again, the sultan grew agitated with Vlad Dracul, who he felt had betrayed him in his alliance with Hunyadi. He summoned Dracul back to Adrianople, where he was arrested and imprisoned at Gallipoli. With Vlad Dracul out of the way, Sultan Murad attacked Valachia and was defeated by Hunyadi. As the throne was vacant, Hunyadi chose his right-hand man, Basarab II of the House of Dan, to be the new prince of Valachia. That put the sultan in a pinch. Valachia had just been an Ottoman subject state, but with Vlad in prison at Gallipoli, it had gone over to the Hungarians. What to do? What to do? The sultan decided he would release Vlad Dracul and send him to Valachia with a large Ottoman army. Since he knew he couldn't trust Vlad, he demanded that Dracul leave his two sons behind as hostages that would guarantee his good faith. This is where we first hear of Vlad Dracula in history books. Not quite a teenager, Vlad and his younger brother Radu were taken to Anatolia in central Turkey, where they were kept imprisoned by the sultan. In 1443, Vlad Dracul invaded Valachia and reclaimed his throne. Basarab was killed, and the boyars who felt threatened by the growing interference of the Catholic-Polish-Hungarian kingdom welcomed Vlad Dracul back. The house where he was born in Zigishwara is still celebrated today as the birthplace of Dracula. At the time of his birth, probably around 1431, his father would have been governor of Transylvania. Vlad Dracula had two other brothers from the same mother, Mircea, who was older, and Radu, who was younger. All by birthright were Draculas. He also had two brothers from a different mother, Vlad, again, and Mircea, again. We don't know much about Vlad's youth. No one has found a diary. We do know of his imprisonment in the city of Egragaz in 1444, where he was kept as a hostage with his brother Radu as a good faith measure by their father, Vlad Dracul. That promise was kept, but Vlad remained in Egragaz until 1448. Presumably, he learned some Turkish while he was there and may have picked up some pointers about the Ottoman use of power and organization. Meanwhile, Vlad's dad found himself in a bit of a pickle. While his two sons were being held hostage by the sultan, Vlad Dracul was still a member of the Order of the Dragons, which comes with some responsibilities and duties, primarily kill the infidel Ottomans. John Hunyadi demanded that Dracul fulfill his obligations and join him and King Ladislaus in an attack on the Ottomans. Trying to steer a middle course, Dracul sent his son Mircea to assist Hunyadi, a move that probably didn't sit well with the Transylvanian governor. However, Dracul had pleaded with Ladislaus, telling him not to go forward with the attack on the Sultan because he took more attendance with him on a hunt than the Polish king and soldiers in his entire army. That attack ended in a disastrous defeat for the Christian Crusaders at the Battle of Varna on November 10, 1444. King Ladislaus and the papal legate, Cardinal Cesarini, were both killed in the fighting. In the chaotic retreat, Dracul captured and arrested Hunyadi, blaming him personally for the defeat. Dracul was set to execute Hunyadi when other nobles intervened and bought Dracul off with a ransom. Still eager to secure his southern border against the Ottomans, Dracul teamed up with the Burgundian crusader Valerin de Vavavrin. Using his navy, he attacked the island fortress of Giorgio in the Danube River. The attack succeeded and the Ottomans inside the fortress surrendered. Dracul freed 12,000 Bulgarians who had been forced to serve the Sultan. He did, however, slaughter the Ottoman garrison there. The relationship between Valachia and Hungary soon grew frigid. In a letter written in 1445 to the townspeople of Brasov, Dracula complained that Valachian merchants were being arrested in Transylvania, although he had left his little children to be butchered for Christian peace so that he and his country could be subjects of the king of Hungary. Vlad was convinced that the sultan had murdered his two sons, which wasn't true. Nonetheless, Dracul reached out again to the sultan, even agreeing to return the Bulgarians he had just liberated. 
Vlad then supported a candidate to the Moldavian throne that John Hunyadi bitterly opposed. In 1447, Hunyadi threw his open support to Dracul's cousin Vladislav for the Valekian throne. As you might have guessed, Vladislav was a Dan, not a dragon. With Vladislav in tow, Hunyadi attacked Targoviste, the capital of Wallachia, with a large force, and Dracul made a run for it. He was captured and killed near the town of Baltini. His son Mircha, who Vlad was clearly grooming to be the next prince, was buried alive by the boyars of Targoviste. The throne of Valachia was passed again to Vladislav and the House of Dan. At this point, you have to feel a little sorry for Vlad the Impaler. He and his brother are still being held captive in the middle of the Ottoman Empire, hundreds of miles from home. His house has just been disgraced. The despised House of Dan is triumphant. The local boyars are not on his side. His ancestors have not only been caught up in a struggle with their cousins, they have been stuck in an impossible position located between two empires that have been kicking Vilecki around like a football for years. His father is dead, his brother was buried alive, and really, other than his kid brother Radu, who are his friends. Life looks a bit bleak for our future impaler. But Vlad Dracula had two things going for him. One, he had a rightful place on the throne of Valachia. He just needed to overcome the usurpers. And two, his opponents were incredibly stupid or unlucky. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Shortly after becoming prince in 1448, Vladislav II and John Hunyadi attacked the Ottomans in Serbia near the city of Kosovo, and they got creamed. Hunyadi, in his retreat from the battlefield, was taken prisoner by the prince of Serbia. The sultan did what he and his Hungarian counterpart often did at a time like this. He threw his support behind the rival claimant to the throne. That would be the teenage Vlad Dracula. With the consent of the sultan and the help of Ottoman troops, Vlad entered Valachia and took his place on the throne that Vladislav had vacated in order to fight in Serbia. We don't know very much about Vlad Dracula's first reign as Prince of Valachia in 1448 except that it was very brief, probably just through the autumn of that year. There isn't very much information about Vlad from that time. There's a signed letter from him addressed to the people of Transylvania, whose governor requested his presence. In the letter, Vlad tells the Transylvanians he will not be able to visit them. If he left his throne, he wrote, the sultan would sweep in, take control of the principality, and kill all the boyars. Thank you very much for your kind appeal, but I trust the Transylvanians as far as I can throw them. Okay, he actually said if anything happened due to his being unable to travel to Transylvania, God would be responsible. But everyone got the gist of it. By November 1448, it appears it was not the Turks who would dethrone him, but Vladislav II, backed by an army of Moldavians. Hunyadi's deputy, Nicholas Vizaknai, urged Vlad to come to meet with him in Transylvania but Vlad refused him. Vlad wrote to the counselors at Brazov in Transylvania, We bring you news that Vizaknai writes to us and asks us to be so kind as to come to him until Hunyadi returns from the war. We are unable to do this because an emissary from Nicopolis came to us and said with great certainty that Murad II had defeated Hunyadi. If we come to Vizaknai now, the Ottomans could come and kill both you and us. Therefore, we ask you to have patience until we see what has happened to Hunyadi. If he returns from the war, we will meet him and we will make peace with him. But if you will be our enemies now, and if something happens, you will have to answer for it before God. Vladislav II returned from Kosovo with the aid of Petru II, Prince of Moldavia. Vlad Dracula, no longer supported by his Ottoman troops, was forced to abandon his throne. There are not many records available concerning Vlad's time away from Valachia. Scholars agree that he returned to the Ottoman Empire. He probably landed in Adrianople, the capital again. After a short stay, he moved on to Moldavia, where he paid a visit to his uncle, Bogdan II, who had taken over as Prince of Moldavia in 1449. Bogdan took Dracula under his wing, so to say, 
but that relationship did not last long as Bogdan was murdered by Petru II in October 1451. Now joined by his cousin Stefan, Bogdan's son, he sought refuge in Transylvania, where Vlad hoped he could convince the recently restored governor there, Hunyadi, to return him to the Wallachian throne. Unfortunately for Vlad, Hungary had just signed a peace treaty with the Turks, and Hunyadi did not want to rock a boat that had just recently steadied. The best Vlad could get from Hunyadi was a promise that Hungary would support whoever the boyars elected after Vladislav died. Disappointed, he returned to Moldavia, where Vlad's distant cousin, Alexandro, had just assumed the throne. The records are scant and sketchy again at this point, but it appears that young Vlad bided his time in Moldavia. During that time, relations between the Hungarian governor Hunyadi and the Wallachian prince Vladislav heated and cooled based on their respective policy decisions. In 1554, Hunyade bit off the Wallachian duchies of Amlas and Fagaras, proclaiming those to be under his domain. That was followed in 1455 by a combined Wallachian and Turkish raid on Transylvania. It wasn't long before Vlad Dracula was receiving some encouraging correspondence from Hunyadi, telling him what a wonderful prince he had been for those three months back in 1448. In April of 1456, King Ladislav of Hungary was preparing for an attack on Belgrade to counter Ottoman actions in that area. John Hunyadi was tasked with leading that assault and to defend against the now hostile Wallachians under Vladislav II. Hunyadi put Vlad Dracula in charge of defending the borders of Transylvania, which happened to border Wallachia and would be a great launching point for an invasion of Wallachia. You know, just saying. We don't know exactly what happened next, but at some point over the summer, with the help of Hungarian army, Vlad did invade Wallachia, seize the throne, and dispatch Vladislav II in battle. Home again, home again, jiggity jig. At the same time, John Hunyadi died of plague during the assault on Belgrade. He had been Vlad's greatest enemy and his momentary savior. Having to contend with Hungarians and Turks outside Wallachia and resentful boyars inside, Vlad couldn't have been happier to be rid of his predecessor and the man who killed his father and brother. In his first letter to the Transylvanian boyars, he promised to protect them in case of an Ottoman invasion of Transylvania, but he also sought their assistance if the Ottomans occupied Wallachia. In the same letter, he stated that, when a man or a prince is strong and powerful, he can make peace as he wants to. But when he is weak, a stronger one will come and do what he wants to him. In other words, if you want peace and stability, you will have to accept the tyrant on your southern border. Now time to get down to business. Since punishing the dead is a futile exercise, Vlad, the recrowned prince, turned his attentions to those still living whom he held responsible for his father's and brother's deaths. That would namely be the boyars, the Wallachian aristocrats, who regardless of what prince sat on the throne always seemed to be doing well for themselves. As the story goes, when it was Easter and all the citizens of Targoviste were at the feast and while the young were dancing, he unexpectedly brought his soldiers up and captured all of the boyars and their families. All those who were old he had impaled around the city, while those who were young, together with their wives and children, all dressed up for Easter, he had taken to Poyanari, where they worked to build the fortress there until their clothes fell off and they remained naked. He forced them to continue working in this condition until they had all died, either from exposure or exhaustion. It was because of this incident that he became known as Vlad the Impaler. Now a word about Vlad Tepish's preferred method of execution, or teaching his opponents a lesson as he saw it. If you are not a big fan of medieval torture methods, you may want to skip ahead about 1 minute and 15 seconds. Are we ready? Okay, there are actually two main types of impalement, longitudinal and transversal. With transversal, a large, sharp wooden stake is driven through the victim, entering through the chest or abdomen, and exiting through the back. The stake, along with the victim, were then hammered into the ground. 
If the victim survived the initial staking, gravity would finish off the procedure. The other method of impalement is longitudinal, and this was Vlad's preferred method. The victim was laid down on his belly and slid up at the rectum. A paste was applied to stop the bleeding before a stake was hammered into the body. And it was actually the rounded end of the stake and not the sharp end that was driven through the victim's rectum because that way it took the victim much longer to die. Then the stake with the victim on it was planted into the ground. If the impaled person moved, it would only drive the stake deeper into his body. Done correctly, that is the stake running up the spine instead of through the vital organs, the victim would remain alive for several hours, possibly days. As this method was done outside in the open, it sent a stark message to any other would-be opponents. By some accounts, as many as 20,000 men, women, and children were impaled during the Easter feast in Targoviste. It was his intention to drive home the point... <clears throat> to everyone in Romania that Vlad Dracula was to be taken seriously. The Greek historian Leonikis Chaco Condyles, who lived during Vlad Dracula's lifetime, stated that Vlad quickly affected a great change and utterly revolutionized the affairs of Alekia. Through granting the money, property, and other goods of his victims to his retainers, the lists of the members of the princely council during Vlad's reign also show that only two of them, Voiko Dobrita and Iova, were able to retain their positions between 1457 and 1461. During his second reign, Vlad found himself once again playing the game of trying to appear friendly to both the Ottoman Sultan and the Hungarian king simultaneously. After John Hunyadi died, his son Ladislaus Hunyadi became the new Hungarian governor. Ladislaus was no fan of Vlad's, and one of his first acts was to send a letter to the boyars in the town of Brasov, ordering them to support Vladislav II's brother, Dan III, the next in line to the throne from the house of Dan. In neighboring Sibiu, the Saxon merchants were throwing their support behind Vlad Dracula's half-brother, Vlad the Monk. Yet, less than a year later, Ladislaus the Hungarian king had Ladislaus the Hungarian governor executed, perhaps over concern of deciphering the plural form of Ladislaus. That provoked a civil war in Hungary, and Vlad supported Stefan the son of Bogdan II in his successful effort to seize the throne of Moldavia. Vlad's next move was to punish the merchants and boyars of Brasov and Cebu for plotting against him. German stories recount how Vlad and his army plundered and burned several of the villages in the area, and that Vlad had carried men, women, and children from a Saxon village back to Wallachia, where he had them impaled. In November 1457, King Ladislaus died, leaving no Ladislauses. In 1458, Matthias Corvinus, a younger brother of Ladislaus, was elected the new King of Hungary. The peace treaty between Corvinus and Vlad Dracula ended Dan III's ambitions to take the throne and it returned the duchies of Amlas and Fagaras to Valachian control. The year 1458 actually marked a rare moment of peace for the principalities of Valachia, Moldavia, and Transylvania. But reports from the time show that protectionist trade practices between Valachia and Transylvania led to a deterioration of relations. In 1459, Dan III was back in town with the full support of Matthias Corvinus. In April 1459, Dan III sent a letter to the councillors of Brasov. When I came to visit your town, the old men cried to us with broken hearts about the things with Dracula, our enemy, did, and how he did not remain faithful to our lord, the king, and instead sided with the Turks. And he followed the teachings of the devil when he captured all the Saxon merchants of our town and took all their wealth. But he was not satisfied with their wealth, and he imprisoned them and impaled all forty-one of them. But this did not satisfy him. He then gathered three hundred men, women, and children from our town who were the families of merchants, and he impaled them at the foot of the chapel of St. Jacob while he sat down at a table in their midst and ate his breakfast with great pleasure. I am therefore taking the wealth from some of the merchants of Valachia and giving it to the families who were killed by Vlad Dracula. 
In 1460, Dan III invaded Wallachia with a small force where he was met by Vlad and defeated in battle. German tales then relate that Vlad captured Dan Seltanar and forced him to dig his own grave and ordered that the funeral service be read according to the Christian rite and then he had him beheaded next to his tomb. Vlad's next move was to invade Transylvania in order to punish the inhabitants of Amlas and Fagaris who rebelled against him. Another German tale recounts these events. On St. Bartholomew's Day in 1460, Dracula crossed the forest with his servants and looked for all the Saxons and Amlas that he could find of both sexes. And all those that he could gather together, he ordered to be thrown, one on top of the other, like a hill to be shredded like cabbage with sword and knives. And their chaplain and the others, he did not immediately kill, were taken back to Wallachia where they were hanged. He ordered the entire village and its 30,000 inhabitants to be burned. He then proceeded to Vagaras, where he took the people and brought them to Wallachia, men, women, and children, and he ordered that all of them were to be impaled. There is historical evidence which suggests that Vlad Dracula stopped paying his tribute to the Sultan, probably sometime in the year 1461. At that point, Vlad was feeling pretty good about his relations with the Hungarian king, Matthias Corvinus. As Vlad had promised, he proved to be a tough and strong prince, and that fact alone commanded respect from other rulers. Relations with Transylvania and Moldavia were at a high point. At least no one was pushing around Wallachia, and there had even been a promise from Corvinus that Vlad could marry a member of the Hungarian royal family. Pope Pius was anxious to attack the Ottomans after they had captured the last remnant of the Byzantine Empire, and Corvinus promised to help him. Vlad saw an opportunity. He offered his services to the papacy and the kingdom of Hungary. If the sultan wanted his tribute, he would have to cut through Vlad's army to get it. The new sultan, Mehmed II, sent his envoy Hamza Beg to Wallachia to summon Vlad to Constantinople, the new Ottoman capital. But he gave Hamza secret orders to attack and capture Vlad if the opportunity presented itself. Vlad got word of this plan and captured Hamza and his companion and had them executed. Vlad next moved on the key island fortress of Giorgio, located in the middle of the Danube, and held by the Ottomans. Using the Turkish that Vlad had learned during his captivity, he gave orders to the commander there to let him in. The commander, not knowing that the Vallecchians were now the enemy, let him pass, and the fortress fell into Vlad's hands. With control of the fort at Giorgio, Vlad struck out against the Turks in their own domains. He attacked and destroyed numerous villages throughout the area of modern-day Bulgaria. In a letter to Corvinus, he claimed to have killed 23,884 Turks and Bulgarians in all, not including those who were burned in their houses and whose heads were not presented to our officials. It's such a precise number, you gotta love it. Now fully in against one of the world's main superpowers, Vlad appealed to Corvinus for more troops and assistance. Your Majesty should know that we have broken our peace with the Turks, not for our own benefit, but for that of Your Majesty. In the spring, the Turks shall come for us with evil intentions and with all their power. But they will find no crossing points, for we have burned them all except for Vidin, and we have made the land barren. You should expect them to come by ship from Constantinople and Gallipoli and to cross the Danube with a great army. Therefore, I implore your majesty, should you desire to fight against them, then gather all your country and all of your cavalry and infantry and bring them to Wallachia, and be so kind as to find the Turks here. But it seems that Vlad received little assistance from Corvinus. In the meantime, the sultan was raising his own great army so that he could attack Wallachia just as Vlad expected. That army was anywhere from 60,000 to 150,000 strong, depending on sources. Vlad's army numbered only 22,000, and many of those were recently conscripted peasants. Clearly, he was outnumbered and woefully unprepared to take on the sultan's highly skilled soldiers. The issue is still debated about whether Mehmed wanted to add Vallechia to his Ottoman domain or just take care of his Dracula problem. Several accounts place Vlad's brother Radu the Handsome at the Sultan's side during the campaign. 
It is probably safe to say that Mehmed was only interested in taking down Vlad and installing his younger brother as prince. There would be many other Ottoman campaigns into southeast Europe, many of them successful, but none of them aimed at conquering Wallachia. Mehmed crossed the Danube into Wallachia at the head of his own enormous army, just as Vlad had predicted at the town of Nicopolis. At the same time, the Ottoman navy was attacking the coast, also as Vlad predicted. The Wallachian prince was camped out with his army on the other side of the Danube. He immediately realized he could not fight such a massive army out in the open, and instead retreated using guerrilla tactics and a scorched earth policy. The sultan and his army headed straight for the city of Targoviste, setting up camp just outside the capital. It was there that Vlad Dracula made his most famous stand against the Turks, a daring late-night raid right into the middle of their camp. His goal was to locate the sultan's tent, assassinate the monarch, and sow confusion and despair among the Ottoman soldiers. If he could take out the sultan, the Turks would have no choice but to retreat and return home. The historian Chalk on Dials described the attack. Vlad Dracula and his force started out at the end of the first night watch, and he invaded the emperor's camp. At first there was a lot of terror in the camp because the people had thought that a new foreign army had come to attack them. Frightened, they considered themselves to be lost as the attack was preceded by a display of torchlights and battle horns. In closed ranks, Vlad and his force proceeded directly to the sultan's tent. However, he missed his target and instead cut down the sultan's viziers, Mahmud and Isaac. The fighting continued as Vlad and his small force maintained closed ranks. They suffered few losses, but during the skirmish, the sultan had managed to reinforce the security around his tent, while Vlad and his force managed to plunder some of the sultan's riches and kill many people on his way out. He was forced to retreat by daybreak, and the sultan's total losses were few. Vlad Dracula's bold assault on the Sultan and his superior forces had failed, and now he had no choice but to retreat further to his capital of Targoviste, where he faced overwhelming odds. The next day, Mehmed and his troops continued their march. When the Ottomans finally reached Targoviste, they saw to their surprise that the city gates were swung open. No soldiers stood watch upon the walls, and the capital's residents were nowhere to be seen. Mehmed's army marched three miles into town without meeting any resistance. Chaco Condiles describes what they encountered next. The Sultan's army entered into the area of the impalements, which were three kilometers long and one kilometer wide. There were large stakes there on which, as it was said, about 20,000 men, women, and children had been spitted, quite a sight for the Turks and the Sultan himself. The sultan was seized with amazement and said that it was not possible to deprive of his country a man who had done such great deeds, who had such a diabolical understanding of how to govern his realm and its people. And he said that a man who had done such things was worth much. The rest of the Turks were dumbfounded when they saw the multitude of men on the stakes. There were infants, too, affixed to their mothers on the stakes, and birds had made their nests in their entrails. It seems Vlad had been stockpiling corpses from previous raids to create this brutal display, and also impaling all of his Ottoman prisoners of war in preparation for the Sultan's arrival. But the exact source for all the bodies remains somewhat unclear. Torsun Beg, an Ottoman historian, recorded that the Turks suffered from summer heat and thirst during the campaign. The Sultan decided to retreat from Wallachia and march towards Breyla in Moldavia. Stephen III, Prince of Moldavia, hurried to Chilia at the mouth of the Danube to seize the important fortress where a Hungarian garrison had been placed. Vlad also departed for Chilia, but left behind a troop of 6,000 strong to try to hinder the march of the Sultan's army. But they were defeated by the Ottomans. Stephen was wounded during the siege of Chilia and carried back to Moldavia before Vlad arrived at the fortress. The main Ottoman army returned to Constantinople, while Radu the Handsome stayed behind on the Baragan Plain in southeast Moldavia. During the next few months, Vlad Dracula twice defeated his younger brother and his Ottoman allies without capturing him. By now, Vlad had lost the confidence of his largest benefactor, Corvinus, while Radu could still count on the support of Sultan Mehmed. 
Despite his victories, Vlad was fighting a losing battle and his soldiers knew it. They quietly defected over to Radu's side. Vlad's first wife committed suicide by leaping from the towers of Vlad's castle into the waters of the Arges River rather than surrender to the Turks. Vlad escaped through a secret passage and fled into Transylvania and into the Carpathian Mountains. Given the deteriorating state of events, he begged one more time for assistance from the king. In November 1462, King Matthias Corvinus traveled to Transylvania to pay a visit on his old friend. The negotiations between the two rulers lasted for weeks. By that point, Vlad had been absent from Valachia for months, and his younger brother Radu had moved in and took the crown as prince. Most of the boyars, other notables, and foreign dignitaries accepted him as such. Although Corvinus had told the papacy his primary reason for going to Transylvania was to resume the war with the Turks, the king was himself in a pitched battle with the Habsburgs, the much larger empire to his west, and was understandably reluctant to face war on two fronts. At the end of the failed negotiations, King Corvinus ordered his Czech mercenary commander, John Giskra of Brandes, to arrest Vlad Dracula. Reportedly, Vlad by this time had made his escape, but was captured by Brandes at Rukar in Valachia. To explain his rationale for arresting Vlad to the Pope, who had been supplying Corvinus with great sums of cash to fight the Turks, Corvinus presented the pontiff with three letters possibly written by Vlad to the Sultan and to Stephen the Great. In the letters, Vlad Dracula promised Sultan Mehmed that if he, the Sultan, would restore Vlad to his throne in Valachia, Vlad would take up arms against the Hungarians. Most historians now agree that these three letters were forged and that the forger may have been a vengeful Saxon priest. However, the letters were effective and Vlad was found guilty of supporting the Muslim infidels. He was moved to a prison in Belgrade. He was then transferred to Visegrad, a town in northern Hungary with a sturdy but nicely furnished castle. He would remain there for 14 years. There is some debate as to the exact length of Vlad's confinement. The Russian pamphlets from that time indicate that he was a prisoner from 1462 until 1474. The Russian narrative, normally very favorable to Vlad, indicates that even in captivity he could not give up his favorite pastime. He often captured birds and mice and proceeded to torture and mutilate them. Some were beheaded or tarred and feathered and released. Most were impaled on tiny spears. During his years in captivity, Vlad was able to gradually win his way back into the graces of Matthias Corvinus, and he ultimately met and married a member of the royal family, perhaps even the sister of Corvinus, and fathered two sons. It is unlikely that a prisoner would be allowed to marry a member of the royal family, so we should expect that he was not in prison the entire time. As his eldest son was about 10 years old at the point Vlad regained the Valachian throne in 1476, his release probably occurred around 1466. Another possible reason for Vlad's rehabilitation was that the new successor to the Valachian throne, his brother Radu the Handsome, had instituted a very pro-Turkish policy. The Hungarian king may have viewed Dracula as the best possible candidate to retake the throne. The fact that Vlad renounced the Orthodox faith and adopted Catholicism was also surely meant to appease his Hungarian captor. In the 1470s, the Vovoid of Valachia would bounce back and forth between Radu and Basarab Lyota like a badminton birdie. In 1476, Lyota, the latest aspirant from the House of Dan, personally led an expedition into Moldavia to remove his former ally and patron, Stefan the Great. Stefan was defeated, but managed to escape. The Turks invaded later that year, but were forced to retreat after plague broke out among the troops. That summer, Dracula joined forces with Stefan and assisted him in his restoration to the Moldavian throne. Now Hungary and Moldavia had joined Team Dracula, and their combined forces moved to return Vlad Tepes to the throne of Valachia. In November of 1476, a two-prong attack was launched with Vlad leading a Hungarian force from Transylvania and Stefan leading his own force from Moldavia. They easily overcame Basarab's defenses and Vlad was back in his rightful place on the Valachian throne for the third time. 
Stefan and Vlad chased Basarab to Bucharest in the east, where they captured the city and forced Basarab to flee to the protection of Sultan Mehmed. Dracula had retaken his throne and repaired his relations with the monarchs of Hungary and Moldavia, and even restored trade relations with the Saxons. His future was looking so bright he was going to need sunglasses. But don't put on those sunglasses so quickly. Vlad had neglected one important rule of usurpation. Eliminate your predecessor. One month later, Basarab Leota returned to Vileki at the head of a large Ottoman army and regained his throne for the fifth time. We don't have much information about the actual battle, but we do have this report from the Duke of Milan in a letter he wrote to Leonardo Bata, who was in Buda at the time. The Turks entered Valachia and again conquered the country and cut to pieces Dracula, the captain of the King of Hungary, with approximately 4,000 of his men. And that was the end of the road for our hero, the Impaler. He died the way he lived, fighting for his throne. The exact location of Vlad Dracula's remains is unknown to this day. What comes next in our story about Vlad Tepes is the growth of the legend of Dracula. We'll get to what happened to Romania in a moment, but Vlad Dracula's story and what others had to say about him diverged greatly depending on who was telling the story. And how Vlad Dracula went on to become literature's most famous vampire had much more to do with the storytellers than it did any actual facts about Vlad Dracula. Already during his own lifetime, particularly during his confinement in Hungary, stories started to spread about Vlad's atrocities. German Meister singer Michael Beheim wrote a poem about Vlad's deeds based on the conversations a Catholic monk claimed to have had with him while Vlad was in prison. The English translation of the poem is known as Story of a Bloodthirsty Madman Called Dracula of Valachia, and Beheim performed it for Frederick III, the Holy Roman Emperor. In Beheim's story, Vlad impaled two monks in order to expedite their passage to heaven, and then, on more than one occasion, invited nobles to his castle for a sumptuous feast, only to impale them while Vlad sat down to his dinner. German stories about Vlad Dracula started popping up shortly before or after his death. Vlad had treated the Saxon merchants of Transylvania particularly badly, and it's not a surprise that some of his harshest critics were German. These stories, about Vlad's plundering raids in Transylvania, were clearly based on eyewitness accounts because they contain accurate details, including the names of the churches destroyed by Vlad and the dates of the raids. They describe Vlad as a demented psychopath, a sadist, a gruesome murderer, a masochist. He was worse than Caligula and Nero. However, the stories emphasizing Vlad's cruelty are to be treated with caution because his brutal acts were very probably exaggerated or even invented by the Saxons. With the advent of the Gutenberg press in the mid-15th century, stories about Vlad's exploits were ripe for mass production. In fact, books about Vlad were some of the earliest bestsellers. They usually included woodcut pictures depicting Vlad's inhuman acts. Here is one story from one of those German publications. Vlad Dracula was very concerned that all his subjects work and contribute to the common welfare. He once noticed that the poor, vagrants, beggars, and cripples had become very numerous in his land. Consequently, he issued an invitation to all the poor and sick in Valachia to come to Turgoviste for a great feast, claiming that no one should go hungry in his land. As the poor and crippled arrived in the city, they were ushered into a great hall where a fabulous feast was prepared for them. The guests ate and drank late into the night. Vlad himself then made an appearance and asked them, What else do you desire? Do you want to be without cares, lacking nothing in this world? When they responded positively, Vlad ordered the hall boarded up and set on fire. None escaped the flames. Vlad explained his actions to the boyars by claiming that he did this in order that they represent no further burden to other men, and that no one will be poor in my realm. There are at least 20 known manuscripts in a Slavic language that is closely related to Russian. These stories are a mixture of fact and fiction. 
Like the German stories, some of these manuscripts emphasized Vlad's sadistic streak, but also emphasized that his cruelty allowed him to strengthen the central government of Wallachia, when that country was faced with unreliable and often hostile neighbors. There are stories of Vlad leaving a valuable golden chalice hanging in the public square just to dare someone to steal it, knowing full well the punishment they would face if caught. Many of the manuscripts blamed his downfall on his apostasy for converting to Catholicism from Eastern Orthodox. Here's one of those Russian stories. On St. Bartholomew's Day in 1459, Vlad Dracula caused 30,000 of the merchants and nobles of the Transylvanian city of Brazov to be impaled. In order that he might better enjoy the results of his orders, the prince commanded that his table be set up, and that his boyars join him for a feast amongst the forest of impaled corpses. While dining, Vlad noticed that one of his boyars was holding his nose in an effort to alleviate the terrible smell of clotting blood and emptied bowels. Vlad then ordered the sensitive nobleman impaled on a stake higher than all the rest so that he might be above the stench. The other great source of stories came from Romania itself. Many of these writers regarded Vlad as a just ruler and a realistic tyrant who punished criminals and executed unpatriotic boyars to strengthen Wallachia. Vlad's reputation flourished in the mid-19th century when various ethnic groups across Europe were rediscovering their national heritage. Ion Budai Dolano's Tiganiada, or the Gypsy Epic, written in 1875, presented Vlad as a hero fighting against the boyars, the Turks, and surprisingly enough, against vampires and other evil spirits. Vlad battled them at the head of an army composed of gypsies and angels. The poet, Dmitri Bolantinano, emphasized Vlad's triumphs in his Battles of the Romanians. He regarded Vlad as a reformer whose acts of violence were necessary to prevent the despotism of the boyars. During this Romanian Romantic period, Vlad Dracula was often portrayed as one of the nation's greatest rulers, devoting his life to fighting for the country's independence. Constantine C. Garesco remarked, The tortures and executions which Vlad ordered were not out of caprice, but always had a reason, and very often a reason of state. But there were also many Romanian tales written shortly after his death. Here's one. A merchant from a foreign land visited Targoviste. Aware of the reputation of Vlad Dracula's land for honesty, he left a treasure-laden cart unguarded in the street overnight. Upon returning to his wagon in the morning, the merchant was shocked to find 160 golden ducats missing. Then the merchant complained of his loss to the prince. Vlad assured him that the money would be returned. Vlad Dracula then issued a proclamation to the city. Find the thief and return the money, or the city will be destroyed. During the night, he ordered that 160 ducats plus one extra be taken from his own treasury and placed in the merchant's cart. On returning to his cart the next morning and counting his money, the merchant discovered the extra ducat. The merchant returned to Vlad and reported that his money had indeed been returned plus an extra ducat. Meanwhile, the thief had been captured and turned over to the prince's guards along with the stolen money. Vlad ordered the thief impaled and informed the merchant that if he had not reported the extra ducat, he would have been impaled alongside the thief. The Ottoman accounts, understandably, presented him in the darkest light. He was a bloody tyrant, a merciless infidel, who was cruel and treacherous. According to these documents, Vlad performed poorly on the battlefield, but was untrustworthy in diplomacy, and his fate was sealed when he turned on the sultan who had showed him much kindness in the past. Here is one of the Ottoman stories. Two ambassadors of the sultan visited Vlad's court at Turgoviste, when in the presence of the prince they refused to remove their hats or turbans due to religious custom. Vlad ordered that the hats be nailed to their heads, such that they should never have to remove them again. The Ottoman Turks would go on to conquer most of southeastern Europe, but they never took complete control of the Romanian principalities. The sultans preferred to exert moderate influence over the small nations of Wallachia, Transylvania, and Moldavia. They realized there was greater wealth to be found to the north and east 
while the Romanian domains could be used as buffer states against Christian incursions. Ottoman influence tended to strengthen feudalistic systems already in place there, and the local economies would strain under the Turkish blockades against European trade routes. That would eventually lead to the seafaring empires of northern and western Europe. Romania would become the remote and underdeveloped nation that Bram Stoker read about when he did his research on that region late in the 19th century. It was the perfect location for the dark, sinister, and eccentric character with vampiric traits known as Count Dracula. Vlad the Impaler's legacy could have been many things. He left a legacy of abject cruelty, but also of focused determination. He left a legacy of barbarism, but also showed his value as an administrator. He left a legacy of betrayal, as well as loyalty, that was dependent upon his immediate needs. But the legacy he leaves for us is his symbol of devilry, lust, manipulation, and want. Because the greatest legacy he leaves is that he was the inspiration for Bram Stoker's gothic character, Count Dracula. Stoker, the Irish novelist who never visited Romania, was most certainly inspired by the historical figure of Vlad Tepish and by the stories of vampires which were quite common in the Balkans, particularly during the 17th and 18th centuries. These stories made their way to Western Europe, including Ireland and England, right around the lifetime of Stoker. He was also influenced by the Hungarian writer and historian Armin Vambery, who he met personally. Vambury would regale Stoker with stories of vampires and other horrific beasts, such as werewolves, that often took place in the Carpathian Mountains of Romania. Stoker obviously used Vlag's cognomen, Dracula, as the name of his character and gave him the title of Count, just as Vlad did the title of Vavoid, or Prince. The only way to kill the fictional Dracula was to drive a wooden stake through his heart. This was obviously a nod to the historical Dracula who had a preference for driving stakes through the hearts of his victims. The most concrete evidence we have that Stoker based his character on Vlad Dracula is this line in the book spoken by the Count himself. Who was it but one of my own race who as Vavoid crossed the Danube and beat the Turk in his own ground? Whether you prefer Max Schreck in Nosferatu, Bela Lugosi's 1931 film appearance as the Count, or the portrayals of Christopher Lee or Frank Langella, Gary Oldman, Tom Cruise, or even Edward Cullen and Barnabas Collins, you have the legacy of Vlad Tepish, a.k.a. The Impaler, to thank for it. I appreciate your joining me for the podcast of Doom. Please feel free to comment regarding your thoughts by emailing me at podcastofdoom at aol.com or visit me at www.thepodcastofdoom.com. If you like the show, please remember to leave a review or rating on your preferred podcast provider, whether that is iTunes or another carrier. Also, I'm taking questions about any previous episode or the podcast in general, and I hope to have that segment out following the next episode. Next time, we will take a look at the government crackdown at Tiananmen Square, Statues were erected and then torn down, peaceful protesters were met with violence, and there was a call for less government intervention in daily life, as well as a change in culture and society. Sometimes the more that history repeats itself, the more it stays the same. Until then, keep your ears pinned, your tail taut, and your canine sharp. <laughs>